taking the role of, of a liturgist. Our first scripture this morning is from John, the 19th, cha- 19th chapter, verses 16 through 18. Um, actually, a rather appropriate passage as we get ready to head into the season of Lent. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the tol- soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened it to the cross, and read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate. Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Now we go to Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is this one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. This is the word of our Lord. Those might seem to be two kind of weird passages to pair together on a Sunday morning. Uh, But it's going to make sense here in just a moment. We're continuing our Everywhere is Signed series. We're looking at the images in the stained glass around the sanctuary and drawing some uh, meaning from, from them as we look into the scriptures and uh, we've almost got them covered, actually. So far, we've done the crown, we've done our two doves, we've done the Bibles, we've done the Alpha and the Omega. Um, today, we are doing this IHS, which is going to preach on three letters. Um, so, this IHS really is just a contraction of the Latin Jesus. Okay, it's not all the letters. It pulled a few of them out of there. But that's essentially what that means. When you see this IHS, that's what it's communicating, Jesus. Now, a lot of times where we see this is when we see Jesus hanging on a cross, images of, of that moment, we'll see this IHS popped on the top of the cross, which makes sense to a degree because Jesus is the one hanging on the cross. It reminds us that that's who it is. But if we look at the Scripture, it's incomplete, because that's not the only thing that Pilate asked to be written on the cross, which is why sometimes, rather than IHS, you'll see I-N-R-I. And that is just the first letter of the Latin words for Jesus, King of the Jews. That's what I-N-R-I means. So we're going to take a look a little bit about, literally, this sign and, and, and what it kind of drives us to in understanding a little bit more about Jesus, but most importantly, what it means for us to follow Jesus. A lot of times people think that this was something that was unusual, that Pilate would fasten a sign to the cross, but it's not. Because the crucifixion was a punishment, but it wasn't only a punishment, it was also a deterrent. That's why they left the bodies hang on the cross for days and weeks afterwards so that when people walked by, it was a reminder, if you step out of line, this could be you. But if you're trying to deter someone from doing something, you kind of need to know why the people were crucified to begin with. So it wasn't uncommon for there to be some kind of an inscription on that cross letting people know what this person did that merited their crucifixion. And for Jesus... Being king of the Jews, claiming king of the Jews was sufficient to put him on the cross. Because anybody that equated themselves with Caesar was guilty of treason. Particularly somebody who was known to be starting a bit of a movement within a group of people. And the Jews were known to be kind of an ornery group of people that every now and again had a rebellion pop off within the Roman Empire. So you get this guy king of the Jews, equating himself with Caesar, starting a movement. Remember the beginning of the, the last week of his life, what does he do? He goes in and he flips the tables over in the temple. So now he's putting action, genuine action, that's disturbing the peace behind his words and his movement, and that's a good enough reason to put him on a cross. Now, 
Sometimes I, I hear folks want to kind of soften Pilate a little bit because he made this sign. And, and, and I hear people sometimes say that this is a sign that Pilate had sort of come around to recognizing who Jesus really is. I don't think that passes muster. Because that's not the kind of guy that Pontius Pilate was. That's not what he was looking for. And we're going to see something about, though, between both Pilate and the priest that was in common regarding Jesus, but them coming around to his way of thinking was not one of them. Much, much more likely this was Pilate saying, oh, this is the king? This is the king of the Jews? Well, take a look at what happens to even your king when he gets uppity. So if it can happen to him, it can happen to you. And the priests, we see, are disturbed by this. Because the priests don't want anything to give any credibility to this claim that Jesus is making or the people are making about him. Because if you have a movement and then you have other people verify that there's something legitimate about that movement and then somebody kills the leader of the movement, they make him a what? A martyr. And that is something that often galvanizes groups of people together to make them even more passionate about what they're doing, not less. And while we don't see that in the immediate days following the crucifixion, after Jesus is resurrected, we see that happen very much with his disciples, and they go and shake the world. But there's something that's important about Pilate and, 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 and these priests, and that is that they clearly regarded Jesus as someone of note, that he's somebody that was making a difference, that he's somebody that was, had a message, and it wasn't just a message that was kind of lip service and gum flapping, but he was doing something that was getting people stirred up. He was acting in a way that backed up the words that he was saying. He wasn't just a speaker. He was a healer. He, was, he loved people. He stood up for people who were oppressed. He wasn't afraid to talk to these religious leaders that were way off base and were trying to cause problems for him. He put his money where his mouth was. And that made him someone of regard. Unfortunately, because Jesus was standing against the wickedness and the corruption and the evil of the world, the people that were participating in that wickedness and corruption didn't like him very much. And that would include Pilate, and that would include the priest at the time. So even though they stood against him, they did have a regard for him, and they knew there was something powerful and authoritative about this man, so we, we got to take him out. But there's something that, that goes along with this, and it's the reason we have these two scriptures together is that this term king of the Jews is more a Gentile term than a Jewish term. Because Jews consider themselves a nation of what? Israel. So if they're talking about a king, they're more likely to talk about the king of Israel, not the king of the Jews. This was something that was more Gentile talking about the people from Judea. And we see this show up not just at the end of Jesus' life, but at the beginning of Jesus' life as well. And there's something about this term that really stirs the pot. Because the Magi come, and they go to Herod, and who are they looking for? King of the Jews. And Herod flips his wig. He loses it. Greatly disturbed is an understatement. Did you remember what Herod does to try to, to get rid of this, this newborn king? He sends out an edict to kill all of these, these, these uh, male ch children two years and younger. So this term is enough to really ruffle some feathers. And you understand it with Herod because King Herod is a Jewish Roman. He's in charge of that region. So if he hears there's another king on the way, that puts him in jeopardy. But there's something else at work here, too. If there's another king on the way, that means in his region there's somebody up and coming that's going to cause problems for Caesar. And you don't want to be the guy in charge of the province that's causing problems for Caesar. If you remember in the story of the crucifixion, that's part of what had Pontius Pilate so rattled up. Because the priests are saying, hey, you're going to do this or we're going to cause some real issues for you. 
Now, Pilate has a decision. He's the governor of this region that was notoriously prickly to begin with, and he couldn't really afford in his career to have an uprising on his hands. And so, according to the story, he gives into their request. But there's something really interesting. Herod sends out the message to kill all these kids. And what does Joseph do with his family? Beats feet to Egypt. And when things settle down, they come back. Now, does the label king of the Jews ever go away from Jesus? Was he the king of the Jews from the moment he was born? Was he the Messiah the moment he was born? The label, I think, sticks. Like, that's the whole sense of what we talk about when we talk about Christmas and Advent and we talk about Jesus coming. It's the sense that the Messiah has come. Go, see this child, which is Christ the Lord, right? So he has this label attached to him, but did he have a target on his back for his entire life? If he did, he might not have made it to adulthood. See, the understanding we have is that Jesus really kind of grew up as a normal Jewish boy. You know, he had a traditional Jewish family. He would have observed the traditional Jewish customs. We see that there was something unique about him from the story in the temple where he's kind of stumping the priests and the scribes, and, and, and they're not able to keep pace with him in terms of his understanding of God and Scripture and that kind of thing. But by and large, once Herod did his thing, he just kind of lived life until he came into adulthood. So when does this title become a problem again for him? It becomes a problem when he starts really living into it, when he's in ministry, when he's going out and he's doing things that are shaking the pillars of society, when he's going out there and he's loving radically, when he's speaking in ways that are moving people, when he's engaging in these healings and these miracles, when he's really, really kind of putting it to the religious leaders and the establishment of the day, when he's sitting down in the midst of all of this movement where he's trying to bring people to a deeper faith and he's associating with all the people that the priests are saying you're not supposed to be around and Jesus Jesus is saying, no, 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 you got this wrong. Our relationship with God is about loving each other and about bringing people into relationship with him in a way that is reconciling, in a way that is redemptive. That is what we're supposed to be doing. We're not supposed to be excluding. We're supposed to be including. We're not supposed to keep them there. We're supposed to draw them here. There's more to it than what you're telling these people is, is going on. A label means very little if there's nothing to back it up. I can call myself a soccer ball, but until I'm round and bouncing on the ground and getting kicked through a goal, you're just not going to believe it, are you? Labels have no power in and of themselves, unless you're King Herod. But even once that is gone, it's not until Jesus' life takes on that character and bold and radical form that it becomes a problem for him again. So that now, whenever the priests bring him up in front of Pilate, they say, no, th this, isn't, this isn't just someone who's labeled king of the Jews. This is someone who is doing something that is significant. And that's supposed to be you and me. We're supposed to be doing things that are significant. We're supposed to live lives that are filled with this same love, the same mercy, the same grace as Jesus because the bottom line is talk is cheap and people know it. And if we look at some of the heroes even in the Old Testament, we see that it's not necessarily the things they were saying that made them such an inspiration or got them in trouble in the best of ways. It's because of the content of their character. When we look at Abraham, he had some significant family issues, but when he was in the promised land, when he was settling down in this strange land where nobody knew him, he's growing in wealth, he's growing in influence, and what we see in his story is that he's kind of highly regarded by the, the people that are around him. But he wasn't highly regarded by the people that were around him because he was a great talker. It's because of who he was. 
It's because of how he conducted himself. It's because of how he was part of that community. That's what made the difference. Think about Noah. Does it tell us that Noah was a great orator and a great preacher? No. It just tells us that his character was such that it set him apart from everybody else. Because of, of his sense of correctness and living rightly before God, that made him unique, that made him different. And not only did the world take notice of him, but so did God. To the point that God said, well, when we're done with this, we're going to keep you around. But it was who he was that made the difference. Daniel, one of the great stories of the Old Testament. Daniel was not running around you know, jabbering in people's ears, telling them what they were and what they weren't in terms of how they stacked up to his faith. But for Daniel, his faith was just such an innate part of who he was, you couldn't miss it. It stood out. It was such that, that the people that were upset with him because he was doing so well, they knew that there's one thing they could count on Daniel to do, and that was pray. And it doesn't say that he was running around in the middle of the town square and praying out loud and screaming and trying to get people involved. It just says he was in his room, he opened the windows, and he prays. So they set him up. But they weren't setting him up because the way he ran his mouth. They were setting him up because his character was so solid, and he set himself apart from them by who he was. And that matters. And it's the same thing when we look at Jesus. He sets himself apart because he was more than just talk. And I'm telling you, it makes a huge difference. When I was in my early, mid-20s, I was part of a congregation that had a very, very um, evangelizing streak in them. And it was the evangelizing streak where you need to go around and you need to make sure that you tell everybody that if they don't believe in Jesus, they're going to hell. You needed to point out where they're wrong because if you don't point out where they're wrong, then their blood is on your hands because you had a chance and you didn't save them. And it was very in your face. And I even had a T-shirt that was well-liked in this congregation. going to be curious to your reaction because I'm hoping you'll realize, well, I'm wondering if you think I would ever wear this thing now. I hope not. It said, one day, one day Jesus is going to come crash your little party, and if you're not ready, you'll burn. Isn't that a nice way to say hello to somebody? Hey, how you doing? Ready for a barbecue? We were very bold about speaking our faith. We could jabber all of the cliches. We could jabber all of the, the little scriptures and the little twists of scriptures that you can use to try to guilt people and make them feel bad and try to get them to say the words you want them to say and pray the prayer you want them to pray. But there was a real big problem with it. When I look back, I had a big mouth but I had a really tiny heart. I thought I knew a whole lot, and I didn't know anything. And what was happening is I was making a spiritual covering for condemnation, for judgment, for an unwillingness to listen to somebody else as a reason to keep somebody out there because you're not supposed to hang out with people like that. I was a really crummy Christian. And over time, and, and especially talking with people who don't believe, it, it's become very evident to me that like, all I was doing was punching people in the face. And who wants to come and hang around with that? And over time, what I've seen is that Evangelism is not a quick process. It takes time. People have been hurt. People have been hurt by the church. People have been hurt by Christians. 
And that has to get undone. And there's only one group of people that's going to undo that. You know who that is? Us, Christians. And we do that by letting our lives speak for us. You know, and there's all kind of bumper stickers that echo this sentiment. But, I mean, really, the, the question is, you know, do people associate me with being a Christian because I constantly are telling everybody, hey, I'm a Christian, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, you're a Christian, wouldn't you like to be a Christian too? Or do they see it because of the way that I live? Do they see it because of grace and because of love and because of compassion and because of a heart to be open to, to, to anyone that needs some love and to reach out and give a helping hand when somebody needs it? and to live out that spirit of Christ. Now, I'm not saying that we don't communicate our faith verbally. We do. But there's a difference between shoving it down someone's throat and, be too, and, and, and when they don't even want to hear it and living in such a way that they wonder why we are who we are and that it opens a door of conversation where we can communicate graciously and communicate lovingly because we've already communicated in, in action. And then the words matter, right? The words of Jesus made a difference because he backed them up. He was God, which, you know, maybe gives him a little bit of an edge over us. But that pattern is no different. And that's what I want to encourage us to today. This life that we claim, this Savior that we follow, it's worth constantly trying to put our money where our mouth is over and over again. It is worth living the life. It matters to us. It matters to the world. I want to share with you one of the most inspiring things for me as a Christian that I've ever heard in my life. Some of you have heard me say this before. Let's say it again. It was my grandfather's funeral. And I hope at every one of our funerals somebody can stand up and say this about us. A woman stood up. He was a mayor of Steelton for decades. She looks out at the congregation and she says, that man didn't just know the Bible, he lived it. Know the Bible and live it. Amen.